Hey guys, Casey here. Thanks for checking back into the channel. This week I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be restoring a rare and original set of early 1960s American Racing Torque Thrust D wheels. These are not the same wheels that you can buy at Summit Racing for $105 a wheel. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I could have afforded to buy a set of wheels that were already restored, but I'm going to do it myself because I'm broke. Anyway, these are much flatter in the spoke area than the uh, modern reproduction torque thrust Ds. Uh, they're often called the crow's foot wheel. Sometimes people call them the crowd wheel. In aluminum, they were not made in a Ford bolt pattern. Uh, many people will tell me that I'm wrong, but nobody has shown me a set in a Ford pattern yet. So <clears throat> Chevy wheels, Ford car, add to that the confusion that, uh, you know, they're shank style lugs. So Corvettes used half inch studs. Camaros used seven sixteenths inch studs. I've got wheels from both. Um, I'm going to make them fit on the mill. I'm going to glass bead them to, uh, to get the finish, uh, looking nice. And then next week we're going to put them on the big lathe and we're going to put a coat of paint on them. So anyway, it's going to be a two parter. Uh, so make sure you check back next week too, to see the rest. But without further ado, let's get into the video. Oh, and please, if you like what you see in today's video, hit that like button. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you want to see more of in future videos. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and hit that notification bell because that helps me keep the content coming week after week. All right, here we go. Okay, so in my quest to run these cool but tragically rare early 1960s American racing torque thrust wheels, I had to buy my wheels in pairs. In fact, I was lucky to buy them in pairs versus finding individual wheels because pairs are hard to find. Uh, complete sets are harder to find, and when you do see them, they command quite a premium. Uh, but one of the drawbacks to buying your wheels in pairs is that a standard half-inch lug nut doesn't fit these wheels. That's because these wheels are for a Chevy Camaro. 7 16 inch wheel studs versus the more common half inch. So although this is a wheel restoration, one of the things I need to do is I need to open up these lug holes um, to 11 16 of an inch because that is the outside diameter of a half inch mag lug. And then got some nice thick mag washers too so we're going to go ahead and kind of deepen the uh, the recess for the washer at the same time clean them up you know you'll see on used mag wheels you know that looks like somebody used a, a 60 degree acorn lug nut on this thing at one point which ruins them um you know they've had dye metallic corrosion from steel washers where the chrome was rubbed off on the aluminum wheel we can do better Okay, so what we have loaded up in the blaster right now is a uh, glass bead media, um, which is not too aggressive for aluminum, um, but it'll take the paint off of these wheels and uh, leave more of a polished surface on the surfaces. They're gonna remain bare aluminum.
Okay, so with the wheels cleaned up, and it is truly hard to believe that that's the same wheel that went in, but with the wheel all cleaned up, uh, it's time to chuck it up on the mill table. I love glass beating. All right, folks, this is a little segment I like to call, What's Casey Drinking? Underneath my, uh, my famous double koozie, I've got Device Brewing Company's Curious Haze. Device is out of Sacramento, California. Um, this is the first beer from them that I've tried. It's a Northeast style IPA. Um, I've been really into hazies lately. This is a pretty good one. Um, and it's only 7% alcohol by volume, so, you know, doesn't get you too crazy. Um, please do notice, however, that it is not open. I will not be opening it until after I'm done with the uh, big scary machine. So, yeah, don't give me any grief, all right? Anyway. <laughs> all right, so with the uh, wheel clamped to the table, uh, the table centered before I do that uh, process, I've got my 5 8 inch piece of uh, oil hard drill rod in the mill. And what that allows me to do is it's a sort of a, rud a rudimentary way of lining up my hole. Pull the feet over. Try to get close here. <clears throat> All right, so once we're close, disengage the uh, hand wheel. All right, so we're really close there. And this 5 8 uh, drill rod is a really close fit to the hole. Um, so once I get it close, re-engage my hand wheel. Turn the mill on. Drop my gauge in. What I'm doing is I'm just moving it over until I can hear contact. Then I'm drilling out my hand wheel. I have to take up my slack before I drill out my hand wheel. And then... Count how many thousandths of an inch you have until you can hear it hit the other side of the hole. Alright, so let me explain that process uh, with the machine not running. Basically what I'm doing is on my X and Y axis, I'm running my hand wheels back and forth, and we're only talking ten thousandths of an inch max, right? Um, I'm running them back and forth until I hear an audible contact with the side of the hole. When I hear that, um, I know that's my limit, and I can zero my hand wheel and see exactly how many thousandths I have from one side of the hole to the other. In this case, it was about eight thousandths per side. So by splitting the difference, going four thousandths back in from contact, once I've zeroed my hand wheel, I have my gauge perfectly centered in the hole. Um, the appropriate way to do this would be with a edge finder. I have one, but it's a very short edge finder and it doesn't reach down into this hole past my collet. The, the diameter of the collet and the spindle itself is too wide to get down in there. Um, also, uh, in the video, I didn't have the, uh, the, the head of the mill locked. So basically I had to completely redo everything off camera because locking the head of the mill changes the reading at the table by a few thousands. And in this case, I was only playing with a few thousands. So now I've got my X and my Y locked and I'm gonna unlock my Z. I'm gonna unlock my spindle, back my hand wheel out. And we gotta raise the head back up Now, I've already done the other three wheels, so I know that I basically have to get just clear of the top of the wheel before I have enough room to get my gauge out of the way. So once I get there, 
loosen the collet. <clears throat> Give it a tap with my mallet up top. That's how I eject the collet and get our gauge out of the way. So now that we have our collet out of the way, do a half inch collet in place. And the size of the hole that we need is 11 sixteenths of an inch. So we're gonna go ahead and check up our 11 sixteenths bit. All right. So with our 11 16 bit in place, we can drop the head back down. I like to lower the head as close to the work as possible because I have to assume that uh, the spindle, the further you lower it down, the less rigid it is and possibly the less accurate it is. And I'm trying to drill these holes exactly centered. So we get it nice and close, lock the head in place, Lock the Z, however you want to say it. Fire up, hand wheels engaged. Put our bit down. I'd like to back it back off and make sure it looks like I'm drilling centered and I, I certainly am. Z-axis and raise the head back up. <clears throat> Normally you be careful moving chips by hand. This cast uh, machine so nice, it really doesn't, um, they're not sharp. realized I have my chamfer bit sitting on the table so I'm gonna move this just because you don't want to get confused and accidentally grab the wrong size tool and the next thing you know you've ruined your part because you drilled an 11 16 hole to 5 15 16 because it was sitting on your mill table all right so I have a uh, an end mill that I have machined flat. You guys see that? Um, I've machined it flat so that it'll work as a spot face uh, because end mills all have some dish to them and I wanna spot face this hole perfectly flat for the uh, mag wheel washers to recess into. in place we're going to go ahead and lower the head again <laughs> and I like to get the head as close as I can to the work all right lock our z-axis back down and then with the hand wheel engaged lower it down Set my z-axis to zero, back it off, 30, 40 thousandths, fire the machine up, and then go in real slow until we have contact. Alright, I 
can see contact. I'm re-zeroing my dial. I'm just going to start cutting nice and slow. And 20 thousandths depth of cut. Back our hand wheel back off, shut the machine off, unlock the Z again, and raise the head. Have a look at our handiwork. And I think that will work out nicely. All right, so with the, uh, the end mill out of the way, improvised spot base tool um, what I like to do is I drop my washer in pretty nice fit drop my lug in it's not going anywhere so that's how you make a mag wheel fit without flopping all around causing you grief so um, we're not done. Before I unlock my X and my Y, what I like to do is I like to go in. All right, so my chamfering tool doesn't have enough length to get all the way down there and chamfer that hole. And the hole doesn't have to have a chamfer, but I just, I think it looks better and uh, probably accomplishes some purpose. So let's lower the head back down and put a 10 thousandths chamfer on that 20 thousandths spot face. Our Z one more time. Hand wheel is engaged. We're just going to lower our bit down until we make contact. Zero our readout. Back it off. 20 thou. Fire it up. You want to sneak back up on that zero. And there we are. And I'm seeing chips start to fall. So I'm just going to walk the bit down real slow. Nine, nine and a half, and ten. Back our hand wheel back off. Machine off. Unlock our Z. And raise the head. And that's a real nice 10 thousandths chamfer on that hole. Let me bring the camera in so you can see. All right, so there you have it. Um, still need to get some of the chips out of there. But we've got a fresh 20,000 spot face with a nice 10,000 chamfer and the hole is enlarged to 11 sixteenths. So big enough for our half inch mag lugs or mag, uh, mag shank lug nuts, yeah. Anyway, little teeny bit of wobble. I'm also gonna make hub centric rings for these wheels. Anyway, much nicer than the beat up factory seats that we started with. And I kind of feel like this is a must anytime you're restoring a set of these early mag shank wheels. So anyway, all we gotta do is do that four more times. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching again this week. I hope you liked this first part of my American Racing Torque Press D wheel restoration video. 
Uh, make sure you check in next week to see the rest of the uh, process. We're gonna chuck these up in the big lathe then we're gonna hit them with a coat of paint. I'm not gonna make them look brand new. I'm gonna make them look a little old and tatty. So that should be fun. Anyway, uh, thank you again so much, you guys. Please make sure you hit that like button if you like what you saw in today's video. Hit the dislike button if you didn't. Hit me up in the comments to let me know what you want to see more of in future videos. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell because those two things help me keep the content coming week after week. All right, thanks again so much. I truly appreciate each and every one of you, and we'll see you next week.